AI, artificial intelligence. You hear about it on TV, you read about it in the newspaper, but what is it really? And can it be better than we are? I don't think so. I think the real power is when humanity and the technology work together for the good of the world. But Stephen Hawking said, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So is this the end of the world as we know it? Well, it depends on us. Because as technologists, we're very optimistic technologists. We tend to dive headfirst into new technologies. Take the car, for example, the first horseless carriage that came out. It didn't have any seat belts. It wasn't until there was an accident that somebody said, maybe we ought to strap people into this. So you'd think we would have learned a little bit over time, but then came many years later, social media. It sounded great. As a technologist, I dove right in. It's a great way to share pictures with family and friends, but we didn't think about some of the negative side effects that come along with social media. In fact, surveys show that if you use social media, you can actually be lonelier. So the fix for our social media fix is going to be a lot harder than putting in seatbelts. You know, the, the good news is we've had blockbuster movies and world-renowned authors warn us about the dangers of the dystopian AI, or the supreme AI, as they called it in Captain Marvel. The, but the bad news is the time to worry about that's now because the pace of technology is accelerating exponentially. And by exponential, that's, that's a hard thing for us to get our heads around. If I walked 30 steps, I could cross this room, but if I walked 30 exponential steps, two times two times two, 30 times, that's over a billion steps. That's 26 times around the world. It's really hard for us to get our heads around that pace of change. If you think back in time to the printing press in the 1400s, then a couple hundred years later, you had the telescope in the 1600s, then the light bulb in the 1800s. That seems like a fairly decent pace every couple hundred years. But with the invention of the microprocessor and with information technology, we've seen a dramatic evolution and acceleration of technological growth. From the microprocessor to the Macintosh to Google's to driverless cars, it's been amazing. And if you think back just over 10 years ago, we had something called the smartphone. And if you think about how it's changed our world in 10 years, with things like the uberfication of everything, right? The, you know, Uber is not just for taxis. You can press a different button on your smartphone and you can have fast food delivered, or a dog sitter stop by and won't take your dog for a walk. It wasn't until everybody carried around a supercomputer with a GPS in their pocket that we enabled this great change. I'm here to tell you that the change of AI is going to be even greater. AI is around us, and it's involved in all sorts of technology. So it's time for us to think about the implications, because Gartner says, Gartner's an IT research institute, and they said that by 2020, you'll talk to your virtual assistant more than your spouse. I don't know about you, but I love my spouse. And AI will never be better than we are. But the reality is, these technological changes do have social implications. You see it at the dinner table, when everybody's looking at their phone instead of looking each other in the eye. And so it's time for us to think about our seatbelts. And how do we think about seatbelts as we develop this technology and take it forward in the world? There's three things I wanted to point out today about some of the risks and some of the things we could do about those risks as it relates to AI. And the first one's bias. Bias is a huge risk. Let's take Amazon, for example. They said, how can we figure out who the best employees are? Well, let's take all the resumes and let's run them through some machine learning algorithm. We'll take, well, first we'll take all the resumes we had in the past and we'll mark out some of our best employees. We'll train the machine on that and then new resumes, we'll, we'll use the machine to tell us which ones are most likely to be the best employees. Well, the problem with that, most of their past employees were men. So the machine looked at that data and said, well, I'm guessing all the good employees in the future are probably men. And so it was very biased because our data was biased. And it's not just Amazon. In the 70s, a very small percentage of symphony orchestras were women. Why is that? Well, they decided to start doing blind auditions at that time. So they put a blind up in front of the person that was auditioning and that helped, but it didn't make the change they expected until they carpeted the stage. 
And when they carpeted the stage, you could no longer hear that distinct sound of a woman walking up behind the blind for her audition. Suddenly, auditions were fairly gender equal. And today, symphonies are mostly 50% men and 50% women, because we're both good at that. So bias is difficult because the signals are sometimes hidden, sometimes their biases are unconscious, and today the problem is getting even tougher because we, those AI algorithms in our social media tends to filter us things that reinforce our pre-existing biases. So the way to solve this problem is you have to be aware of it. One of the best ways to be aware of it is to hire diverse teams that can identify biases in your data in advance. The second thing we've got to worry about is power. Elon Musk started a foundation called OpenAI because he didn't want any one country or company to have the power of the supreme intelligence all by themselves. And so the idea was to promote dialogue and transparency and allow people to talk about this and bring out the issues. One of the issues, for example, is having a human in the loop for military drone targeting. AI could do the targeting itself, but we like to have a human in the loop. When we're watching those movies like The Terminator, we actually have to take steps to avoid the dystopian future they, they predict, not just enjoy the ending and write a sequel. The third problem, or the third item I'd like you to think about, is the word artificial in AI, and what if we replaced it with the word augmented? Many have suggested that maybe AI should stand for augmented intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. And I tend to agree. And the reality is, we're already augmented. So if you look at this picture of Tiger Woods golfing, in 2002, you have a whole crowd watching Tiger Woods golf. Fairly simple. In 2018, you look at Tiger Woods golfing again. This time, very few people are actually watching Tiger Woods directly. They're watching him through their smartphone. We're already augmented. When I go to the gym on Saturday mornings, as soon as I get close to my car, a little notification pops up my phone and says, 12 minutes to the gym. I don't have them on my calendar. It just knows that normally on Saturday mornings, if I'm gonna get in my car, I'm heading to the gym. And so it tells me that. We are already augmented. And the reality is, companies are investing large sums of money in trying to drive augmentation of the man in the machine, or humanity in the machine. And a good example of that is voice. Voice technology is getting a lot of investment. You see it in Google Home and the Alexa appliances. But the voice technology is improving. It's designed to help drive the input between the human and the machine. Instead of typing words in one character at a time, you simply talk to the computer. At the same time, augmented reality and virtual reality is designed to help the computer communicate back to us in a more rich fashion its answers and its conclusions. So both those technologies are about bringing humanity and the machine together. And the third technology that's getting a lot of investment is called the Internet of Things. That just means that the computer is being put into th everyday objects all around us so that we can talk to that computer wherever we are. So if these are the three big areas that people are investing in technology, we also have to invest in what? Our seatbelts. We need to make sure we've got our seatbelts for AI before the big problems happen. Let's not wait until the first car accident to put seatbelts in. Let's think about it now and plan for those issues and address them up front. And the, the good news is the anecdote for the dystopian future is humanity itself whether it's the diversity of teams to help identify bias, or good, honest dialogue between one another, open dialogue on difficult problems, or working together to try to make sure that our data that we train the machine with is fair and unbiased. That's the antidote. The antidote is humanity, because AI can't be better than we are. Thank you. Thank you.